the presentation of anarchism a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation economic social political and spiritual of the human race the emancipation Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Anarchy on Two Wheels by Jim Yeoman. One of the problems which faces anarchists is that of being an apparently permanent and minute minority. What exactly do you do in such circumstances? What kind of social action do we take? These questions are posed by John Schubert in his piece, Revolution and White Bikes, which opens issue 66 of Anarchy, a monthly magazine published by Freedom Press in London through the 1960s. And this issue was published in August 1966, and focused on the Provo movement in Amsterdam, a countercultural anarchistic grouping which, over the summer of 66, had been involved in protests against the Dutch police, which prompted a violent response in kind, as well as hundreds of arrests and a clampdown on all public demonstrations. It was in this context that the editors and contributors of Anarchy sought to explain and situate Provo for their readers. I came across this issue of anarchy while starting some broader research into radical or anarchist politics and cycling. My interest in this topic has stemmed from a rather abrupt change in my work life. Having left employment in academia, where I'd begun a career as a historian of anarchism in Spain, and started working for a cycling charity. I wanted to know more about how cycling had been used as a spur or implement of radical change, and what if anything, past examples of this type of action were relevant to contemporary discussion and action. Alongside critical mass, a form of direct action on cycles which originated in the 1990s and involved mass rides through cities usually clogged by motor traffic, the name which reoccurred most often in these kind of initial explorations into this world was that of Provo and the White Bicycles Initiative. This, in turn, led me to Anarchy 66, which will be the focus of this essay. In the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to give a broad outline of Provo and its most distinctive initiative, before moving on to give a sense of how both were conveyed to an audience of British anarchists. While this is a fairly specific angle of a very small example of anarchist history, I'm drawn to this slice of radical reflection. As we shall see, the response to Provo from across the channel was mixed, to say the least, and brought to mind the difficulties many on the left, including anarchists, have in thinking about groups such as Extinction Rebellion. They, or we, like some of what XR say and do, but just as much as worrying or controversial about the group. I include myself in this, and I feel some affinity with the qualms that contributors to anarchy had with Provo. Now, I don't pretend to present anything particularly conclusive here, but rather to share some thoughts that were inspired by this coalescence of anarchism and cycling, what it hoped to achieve and what others made of it. Throughout, I'll be breaking up the essay with the sounds of a group ride that I did with members of the City of Liverpool FC Cycling Club in September 2021, mainly because I like the sound of cycles moving through the world and the dropping in and out of ear contact with the music that accompanies on the back of a friend's bike. Provo formed in Amsterdam in May 1965 as the coming together of several small youth groups broadly aligned with the anti-war movement. The following month, the group launched their monthly magazine, Provo, which saw its readership as 
anarchists, provosts, beatniks, layabouts, tinkers, jailbirds, saints, sorcerers, charlatans, philosophers, germ carriers, major domos, happeners, vegetarians, syndicalists, hustlers, incendiaries, marionettes, infant teachers, and the internal security service. From this opening line to the article, This is Provo, written by the group's main theorist, Royal Van Dun, and reproduced in Anarchy 66, we get a sense of the group's position. Explicitly self-styled as anarchists, with an eclectic, self-effacing tone, common to radical groups of this era. Van Dun goes on to outline the group's view of society and how Provo hoped to change it. Probo feels it is faced with two choices, either desperate resistance or passive withering away. Provo's activity is a spoke in the wheel of progress, and we plead for full-time provocation. Perhaps most striking for me, a scholar of anarchism in the early 20th century, which is almost always positioned as the expression of the working class, Van Dun insists that traditional socialist appeals to the masses were pointless because only the young, idling and provoking masses in the streets can still be set in motion. They are open to resistance, not the so-called working class, which is tied hand and foot to the social system. We cannot convince the masses. We hardly want to. Later on in the issue, Martin Lint and Jim Huggan elaborate on this position, stating that, the methods of the old anarchist movement were too isolated, too small and too stupid, and the existence of groups like Provo and others on the new left were indicative of the death of the antagonism between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, which have both melted into one big indifferent mass of unengaged people worrying only about their television and their second car. The groups Provocation number eight, Appeal to the International Provocariat, published in August 1965, emphasised this point while echoing Van Dun's sardonic style, declaring that the new class opposition is proletariat versus arse people. Instead of bringing the working class to their politics, Provo aimed to rile up agents of the state to a point where they exposed their true nature. In Van Dun's words, the policeman is our best friend. The higher their numbers, the more impertinent and fascistic their behavior, the better for us. In provocation number eight, the group claim, through provocation, we force authority to tear off its mask. Now, none of this was regarded as a solution to society's ills, nor was it even seen as a productive use of energy, but rather a last resort in the face of apathy and resignation. We realize that a demonstration is senseless. We dare to say, demonstrate for demonstration's sake, provoke for provocation's sake, resist for resistance's sake. If only we could be revolutionaries. Here and now, we cannot be much more than insurrectionaries. Good. So what did these insurrectionaries do? What were their provocations? The first major action of the group was a protest against the marriage of Dutch Princess Beatrice to Klaus von Amsberg, a former member of both the Hitler Youth and the Wehrmacht, which took place in July 1965. Provo used this moment to launch their magazine and distribute a fake speech by Beatrice's mother, Queen Juliana, which declared that she'd become an anarchist and was negotiating a transition of power with Provo. After this, the group set off smoke bombs near the royal palace. Rumours were also spread that Provo planned to dump a huge amount of LSD in Amsterdam's water supply. Later initiatives included deliberately getting arrested by the police for apparently smoking cannabis, only to reveal that the joints were filled with tea, hay and herbs. 
Alongside happenings such as these, Provo maintained its magazine and inspired similar publishing activity across the Netherlands. By 1967, they claimed to be printing up to 10,000 copies. Lead printer Rob Stolk claimed that even this solid print run still did not meet the massive demand for their paper, making those who managed to get their hands on a copy extremely lucky. But without a doubt, the action that Provo were and remain most celebrated for was the White Bicycle Plan. The initiative was the idea of industrial engineer Lude Schimmelpenick as a symbolic statement against the dominance of motor traffic on Amsterdam streets. And the plan was very simple. A group gathered up around 50 used bicycles, painted them white and left them unlocked across the city for anyone to use. The white bike symbolises simplicity and hygiene as opposed to the gaudiness and filth of the authoritarian car, read a pamphlet which accompanied the scheme. The distinctive white bicycles made for great imagery, including a photograph of a crowd holding one aloft to the camera, which was stylized by Rufus Sagar for the cover art of Anarchy 66. Now this action gathered a fairly large amount of attention in the Netherlands and abroad, as well as the ire of the Dutch police. The cycles were confiscated under the pretext that they were liable to be stolen, which would, in turn, waste police time in tracking them down. Bicycles, by law, had to be locked when in public. In the words of Peace News writer Barnaby Martin, you were forced to protect your machine, assuming that others will steal it. It is illegal to trust others. By declaring that their bicycles will be left unlocked, the provosts provocatively asserted their belief in founding social relationships on trust and responsibility. And by painting their machines distinctively, told police and potential thieves alike where their principles lay. In characteristically sardonic style, when it became clear that unlocked bicycles would be removed from the streets, Provo secured them with combination locks with the code painted on the frame so that anyone could release them. The contributors to Anarchy 66 were sceptical about much of what Provo said and did. Schubert described the group's publication as a mixture of anarchism and nihilism and flamboyant nonsense. While later in the issue, Jim Huggan identified an inherent confusion in their outlook, typical of the continental temperament, whatever that was supposed to mean. More interesting than these views from the UK is Charles Radcliffe's eyewitness account of a trip to Amsterdam following the most violent confrontations in the Dutch capital. Radcliffe speaks with a range of people across the city, from a group of youths on the street, a middle-aged friend, and Roel van Dun at the offices of Provo. More than anything, Radcliffe is interested in Provo's public dissociation with recent violence in the city a move which worried Radcliffe and felt familiar to English intellectuals who isolated themselves from the consequences of their politics. What comes through from the teenage provo dressed in white who refused to take a copy of Radcliffe's newspaper up to the leadership of the group is confusion and ideological inconsistency. Perhaps most alarmingly to an anarchist audience, Van Dunn admits that ultimately Provo is a reformist movement, seeking election to the local municipal council so as to, quote, observe authority from inside, while defending the group's decision to disavow the recent violence by saying that their actions were more provocative satire than direct statement. In response, Radcliffe tells him that the provost had betrayed the proletariat. Nevertheless, Radcliffe remains impressed by the experiment in Amsterdam, viewing it as quite definitely the best and most interesting statement on youth revolt to come out of the continent. Perhaps the clearest view on Provo in the issue comes from Radcliffe's friend, who he meets at an Amsterdam cafe. 
They just want their happenings, white bicycles instead of cars in the city, and smoke control. And it was the bicycle plan that Provo were known for at the time and today while their other slightly muddled positions and provocations were largely ignored and then forgotten. While the original white bicycle provocation was small in scale, its originator, Lud Schimmelpenck, had much grander ideas, aiming to push Amsterdam's local government to adopt the scheme and distribute 10,000 white bicycles for free use while heavily restricting motorised travel into the city. Schimmelpenick actually gained a seat on Amsterdam City Council in 1967, a decision which prompted ire from anarchist observers, but his plan was unanimously rejected by other council members. Undeterred, he continued to push his plans for shareable transport alternatives to the private automobile, often through bicycles but also electric cars, a plan which was trialled to little success in 1974. Schimmel Penick went on to be a key part in setting up the first long-lasting bicycle share scheme in the world in Copenhagen in the mid-1990s and returned to launch a new white bicycle plan in Amsterdam in 1999. From there, city bike sharing programmes have spread over the world with an estimated 2 million cycles dedicated to communal use worldwide. I wonder how the original instigators in Provo would regard these initiatives. All of them require some form of payment, some sort of identification and local political support to function, unlike the provocation that the provost intended their free bikes to be. It could also be argued that their impact on motor traffic has been limited, though perhaps it would be unfair to expect a great impact in this area. After all, even the original Provo scheme was less a concrete plan for action and more an attempt to rile up those who saw the car as the glorious future and the bicycle as a relic of the past. In this sense, perhaps the clearer legacy of the white bicycles would be something like critical mass, which has more in common with the attitude and outlook of the provos, even if the city bike feels like a more direct descendant. In the past, I've been quite skeptical of critical mass, having taken part in a few rides and never quite seeing what the point was, in a manner quite similar to my instinctive scepticism of Extinction Rebellion's actions. And while I feel some resonance with the cynicism in Anarchy 66 towards Provo in general, I think this brief foray into the movement and its reception has tempered this somewhat. Like Radcliffe, John Schubert is ultimately positive about Provo, and in particular its white bicycle plan. Returning to his questions which opened Anarchy 66 and this podcast, Schubert regards the white bicycles as an effort to do something in a seemingly hopeless situation, both a political statement and a practical solution to an existing problem. He thinks, therefore, that the provosts have something to teach us, that the answer to the question of what can a handful of people with revolutionary ideas do in a profoundly non-revolutionary situation is to find imaginative direct action solutions to immediate, close at hand problems of everyday life. Following this, he goes on to quote David Wake in a previous issue of Anarchy, which I feel is a good place to wrap up. Proceeding with the belief that in every situation, every individual and group has the possibility of some direct action on some level of generality, we may discover much that has been unrecognised and the importance of much that has been underrated. The habit of direct action is, perhaps, identical with the habit of being free and prepared to live in a free society. Saying this, one recognises that just this moment, just this issue, is not likely to be the one occasion when we all come of age. All true. The question is, when will we begin?
Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.